Hey everybody, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to another ODYR webinar. Thanks for making it out tonight. Tonight is all about TOSIS. Now, uh, I know that many of you, I guess it was about a year ago, saw a webinar that we did here about this very same topic, where we sort of covered the, the pathophysiology and kind of the background of the condition, because a lot of folks, including me, you know, you learn about it in school, it all drains out, you forget it all. But now, of course, we're you know starting to see more of it because we actually have good treatments for it. So I think it's become, over the past year at least, uh, a much hotter topic that people are interested in. So tonight we're going to take a little bit of a different angle, uh, cover a little bit of the background, but also talk about uh, you know seeing ptosis clinically um, and trying to figure out you know what it is and how you manage it when you do see it. Uh, and again, we have two experts uh, with us here tonight to take us through this. We have Kelly Malloy, who's the Chief Neuroophthalmic Disease Service at the Eye Institute at PCO. And of course, Susan Resnick, who is a principal at Drs. Farkas, Castello, Resnick and Associates in New York City and a veteran of numerous ODYR webinars. So Kelly, Susan, thank you so much for being here tonight. Great, Adam, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with everybody. Thank you for joining us. And as Adam said, this is kind of like part two of what we did a little over a year ago. Um, and things are getting you know, more exciting because we are learning more. And as Adam said, we have some treatment options now and we're all paying more attention to the lids. It's sort of like the part of the eye that's easy to forget. I mean, we, we pay attention because we're into dry eye and blepharitis and things like that. But very often we kind of don't see the forest for the trees. So we want to sort of look at the forest. You know, I think of the lid as being sort of the window dressing to the face because not only does it have a functional value, but it has an aesthetic value. Tonight's discussion is going to center around the functional value. So let's start by reviewing the clinical definition of blepharotosis, or as I'm going to call it, ptosis. It's an abnormal, low-lying or drooping upper eyelid margin with the eye in primary gaze. And we gauge the severity based on the amount of the eyelid droop. So a droop of one to two millimeters will generally correspond to limited visual impairment. Impairment patients may not notice much going on at all. Two to four millimeters of droop uh, would probably start to cause a medium visual impairment where they may find in certain conditions if they have to look up, uh, or look to the side or towards the end of the day, their vision starts to get a little bit, you know, blurry or fatiguing. And more than four millimeters of droop would probably correlate to a more significant visual impairment. But more importantly, ptosis can have a wide range of effects on patients. Um, untreated ptosis can impact visual function and not just to the pupil obstruction, but also because it can cause superior visual field defects deficits and we're going to look a little more specifically at that in just a few minutes and then certainly we do have the aesthetic or cosmetic aspect and patients will complain about seeing one eye low one lid lower than the other or they'll look sleepy and if your patients are my like mine they typically will notice it when they look at photos of themselves they'll say you know i was an event and we took pictures or you know my family's noticing that one eye always looks a little smaller than the other so that is often what they'll bring up in conversation. And that sometimes is the first clue, but what we're gonna get into a little bit tonight is why that shouldn't be the first clue, that we have the opportunity to spot this and bring up the discussion before the patients actually notice it. So how common is ptosis? Um, you know, it, affects, it can affect individuals of all ages, but we know that it is known to increase with age. And with our aging population, millions of people at age 40 or older at risk for developing ptosis. So if we look here at the U.S. population chart, we can see that, you know, around this year, the, you know, the start of this decade, we had a little under 130 million people between the ages of 35 and 64. But look what happens in 15 years. It's raising about, or rising about seven or eight million. And so that's a significant, you know, amount that's, you know, uh, you know, about 2%. Um, if you look, though, look at the steepest part of the curve down here at greater than or equal to 65. And we're going from about 55 million to close to 80 million. And we know that ptosis or the severity of ptosis increases as patients get older. But also think about this. Today's 65 or 70-year-old is not the 65 or 75-year-old of 10 years ago. 
you know, these people are much younger in their mind and in their bodies. So while we might have a few years ago pupitosis in a 70 or 75 year old, you know, these people are for the most part young, healthy and active and they care about the way they look. So it becomes more important for us to identify ptosis um, every day in our practices. Okay, so we want to review the anatomy a little bit because to understand the lid function and changes in um, lid position, it's helpful to review the anatomy. So just remember that the elevation of the upper eyelid is largely provided by two muscles. We have the levator palpebrae superioris, which we'll call the levator, and then we have Mueller's muscle, which is also known as the superior tarsal muscle. Recall that the levator originates from the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. It, tra it traverses the orbit, so it goes through the orbital septum, and then it becomes a fibrous um, aponeurosis. It almost has like finger-like interdigitations as it inserts onto the anterior aspect of the tarsal plate. Keep in mind that the levator is innervated by the ocular motor nerve, cranial nerve three, because this is going to be important. And its contraction provides the majority of upper eyelid elevation. But then we have Mueller's muscle, which arises from just underneath the levator at the level of the distal aponeurosis, and it then inserts into the superior tarsal plate as well. This muscle is involuntary, it's a smooth muscle, and it's under sympathetic nerve control. Keep in mind also that Mueller's mus muscle predominantly expresses the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor subtype, while the levator predominantly express expresses the beta-1 beta subtype. And this is going to be important when we start talking about the pharmacological action of current treatments for it. And I'm just going to throw in here, just remember that opposing um, levator and Mueller are, is the orbicularis oculi, and that's responsible, if you remember, for both voluntary and reflex eyelid closure. That's innervated by cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve. And that becomes important as we now look at ptosis versus pseudotosis. So what's pseudotosis? You know, just when we thought we had it, they have to throw in this little thing of pseudotosis. But pseudotosis is the absence of pathology of the upper eyelid muscles. And we have to sort of differentiate because pseudotosis can look like ptosis, but it's actually something different. Um, what you may actually see, there are four possible causes of pseudotosis. They could be mechanical, which is what we will call dermatochalasis. And you can see here the picture on the right, um, the eyelids here, you can see the eyelid margin is not too far, it's not too far down, but look at all this droopy skin here. So it's giving the appearance of ptosis. It's very common to have a little bit of both, but one, if it's the Brow ptosis that predominates, that's different. That's not under the muscle control um, of Levator and Mueller, like we discussed. You can have anatomical pseudotosis just from, you know, ocular misalignment, you know, congenital types of disorders. And then you can have something that's called neurogenic. And so the most common causes of pseudotosis are the ones that we see in clinic or brow ptosis. That occurs secondary to descent of the periorbital tissues of the brow. And then hemifacial spasm is not as common, and that's actually caused by segmental involuntary jerks. We call it myoclonus of the muscles, and that's innervated by the facial nerve, and it actually starts with the orbicularis and it spreads. But what's different about that? It's almost always unilateral, and it presents in the fifth or sixth decade of life. And then finally, one of the other more common causes of pseudotosis would be thyroid eye disease. And what actually happens here? Well, you have an abnormal immune reaction which causes swelling in the tissues of the eyelids and the orbit. So it could make the eyelids look puffy as if the person has baggy eyelids. But again, that's not real ptosis, that's pseudotosis. So I'm gonna throw it over to Kelly now. And Kelly, I'm gonna ask you to take us through some important components of the differential diagnosis. Sure, thank you very much, Susan. And we're just going to move on here to the causes of ptosis. So ptosis can be congenital or acquired. Now, most of the time, if it's congenital, you'll know that because you can ask the patient, has this been present your whole life? Is it stable? You can look at old photographs and see that this looks similar to the way their appearance has always been documented. 
Uh, so we have to really discern, is it something congenital? If that's the case and you're seeing them and they're an adult, it's less concerning. Uh, versus could it be something that's acquired? And if it is acquired, we have to find out what is the cause and is it something that could be urgent or in some cases even emergent? First, let's talk a little bit about congenital ptosis. And this is usually a result of developmental myopathy of the levator muscle in most cases. And often it is unilateral, it can be bilateral, but majority of the time it is just one eye. Uh, and in young kids that have a drooping eyelid, if it is a severe droop and it's covering the visual axis, that could lead to amblyopia. So it needs to be identified in kids. Um, and in kids, it can still be an acquired ptosis. So I don't want you to think just because it is a child that you see with a ptosis that it means it's congenital. You always have to see, has it been present since birth and has there been any change? With that in mind, even if you are in say pediatrics and you're seeing infants and you see a baby with a ptosis, you can't always assume that it is congenital because infants can also have pathology. So something to keep in mind and make sure you get everything checked out and evaluated, even in kids. So when we're talking about the acquired types of ptosis, there are five main types, uh, ranging from aponeurotic. And aponeurotic ptosis is something that you may have heard this insertion of the levator muscle. You could hear it by that term as well. And it usually is associated with aging or a lot of eye rubbing or stretching of the eye in some way. And in doing that, the stretching and the rubbing, we get detachment of the levator muscle, um, as you just saw the picture that Susan pointed out. So that levator becomes disinserted. Then we also can have a myogenic ptosis, and this is going to be a problem with the muscles. And usually we're talking about the levator muscle because that does have more function in opening the eyelid. But we could also have an acquired ptosis from a problem with the muscle of Mueller. Then we go on to neurogenic ptosis, and this means a problem with the nerve. And as Susan pointed out, the two nerves involved are going to either be cranial nerve three when we're talking about levator or the sympathetic. Uh, nerves when we're talking about the muscle of Mueller. So that means there's going to be damage or a problem to one of those. And those are things you're going to get a little bit more concerned about. And this is where we're going to get into some of the things that could be medical emergencies. So ptosis is very important to identify. We also have a mechanical ptosis. And this is you know, something that's pushing the eyelids down. So it could be a, a dermoid cyst or some type of a, a mass, like a hemangioma or neurofibroma. And then we can have traumatic ptosis. And now that could kind of overlap with some of the above categories because it depends what you have trauma to. Do you have trauma to the aponeurosis? Do you have trauma to the muscles? Or do you have trauma to the nerve? So they all can uh, be damaged depending on the type of trauma. So again, we have different causes of acquired ptosis. What are the risk factors for developing acquired ptosis? Well, one of the risk factors has found to be age. Okay, So this is a study here that's shown um, looking at data from a Korean study. So this is patients that are Korean men and women, uh, 40 years of age and older. And when you're looking at the graph on the left, it's looking at the MRD1. So MRD1 is marginal reflex distance one. So, you know, as Susan was saying, the lids are often overlooked. So we should really get in the habit of measuring eyelid function on all of our patients, especially new patients. So we have something to compare to when they come back. So we can measure that by either palpebral aperture, distance from upper lid to lower lid, or by marginal reflex distance. And so the MRD1 is if you're shining a light in the eye and looking at the Purkinje reflex in the image, you're going, you're measuring from that to the upper lid margin. So that is the MRD1. And when you look at this graph, you can see that in the younger patients on the left, there's a greater amount in that orange color. And that means an MRD1 of four millimeters or greater. And by the time the patients are in their 70s or older, you can see that that orange part of the bar has significantly gotten smaller, as you can see here. Uh, but we're getting more of this bluish color, and that means an MRD1 of a much smaller amount of less than one millimeter. Similarly, we see a similar uh, 
pattern when we look at the levator function. Now, the way we measure levator function clinically is you have the patient look all the way down, and you put the zero of your ruler on the upper lash line, and you'd have the patient not move their head, uh, but just move their eyes all the way up as far as they can, and now see where their la upper lash line intersects that ruler. And in this study, those in the 40 to 49 age range, majority of them had a levator function greater than or equal to 12 millimeters. And by the time they got in their 70s, you can see that proportion has decreased significantly, and there's a greater number that have smaller levator function. So with age, we see changes in both the aperture or MRD as well as the levator function. Some other risk factors for acquired ptosis are surgery, surgery to the eyes. And as you can see uh, on the right, the type of surgery does make a difference with glaucoma being most likely to result in ptosis. Specifically, the trabeculectomy with mitomycin C uh, has greater risk. And then corneal, strabismus, cataract surgeries all can cause ptosis. This tends to occur or has the greatest risk in female patients, those with a narrow palpebral aperture, if they're using a rigid eyelid speculum during the surgery, and if they do a nerve block technique or specifically which type of nerve block technique. If they're doing the nerve block block technique right to the eyelid, uh, it's more likely to be associated with ptosis compared to if they're doing a retroauricular uh, nerve block of the facial nerve that's less likely to be associated with ptosis. And the ptosis that happens because of these surgeries can be transient or permanent. And it happens roughly about 11% of the time. So Kelly, I'm gonna just ju uh, jump in oh, here. Sure, yes. Um, so for me, one of the take homes on that, and then this is something that comes up a lot. So, you know, if a, if a 65 year old woman comes in or 50 or whatever comes in and, you know, they have incipient cataracts and, and, and you know, you're monitoring them, but at the same time, they're like, okay, I'm really, you know, I'm thinking about having a blepharoplasty or a facelift or whatever. You really do have to look because you want to try to get if that cataract surgery is ready to go, you know, pretty soon, you certainly want to let them do any um, uh, uh, ocular surgeries before uh, addressing the cosmetic um, aspect. Do you agree? Yes, definitely. And it's always good to to educate their patient, your patients, on the possibility. Um, and if this does happen as a result of your uh, surgery, there are ways to address it, just so they know. And if it happens, um, they can get checked out. And also, you'd want to make sure that it just because it happened after a surgical procedure doesn't mean it's related to that surgery. They could have had a neurologic event or something. So you still have to go through the same differential process. Correct. And then we also have another risk factor for acquired ptosis, and that's contact lens use. And ptosis has been found to be associated with both soft and uh, rigid or hard contact lens use but it occurs more frequently in those wearing uh, hard contact lenses. And that's thought to be related to the manipulating of the eyelid. So when people are taking out their RGP lenses and they tug on their eyelid, every time they're tugging on that lid, they're causing a little bit of, of damage uh, to the muscle and we get then disinsertion of the levator muscle. And you probably see that a lot in your practice, Susan, especially you know, you've seen a lot of contact lens patients. Yeah, we yeah. Do. created a lot of uh, acquired ptosis in our practice. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm proud of that, but that's just the way it is. But uh, our plastic surgeons, our oculoplastic surgeons are, um, you know, sending them back to us after surgery and obviously um, suggesting we refit them in, into soft lenses. It'll be interesting to see in the coming years with so many more patients going into sclerals, we probably will see a little bit of a decline in that. Right. That's, that's a very good point. And then one more risk factor for acquired ptosis is the use of Botox or botulinum toxin. And so when we are seeing a patient and taking their history, this is definitely something we need to ask about because patients aren't always gonna think that it's important to tell their eye doctor that they've had Botox. Uh, and they might not see an association of why they now are presenting with this droopy eyelid. Um, so definitely something to ask. And keeping in mind that Botox is not just used for cosmesis. Um, so you don't just wanna 
ask about it in terms of, you know, did you ever have any type of treatment to, you know, get rid of your wrinkles, et cetera. Keep in mind that it's definitely a, a used treatment for migraine, for chronic migraine as well. So that's definitely something you want to ask patients. Um, you know, most of the time they know it by name, Botox, but even if not, have you had any treatment for migraines? That's an injection, et cetera. And you can make sure uh, if they had this to know that this could be the reason for their ptosis. And if so, it usually presents most of the time within two to seven days after treatment. And so they're given the Botox in certain areas and you know we hope it doesn't droop down and, and get into these muscles of the lid, but sometimes it does, especially if the patients rub in the area where they had this uh, injection, they can rub and they can spread the Botox to different areas and different muscles. So that's definitely something they should be educated on, not to rub the area if possible. Uh, and then it can occur, and usually within the first week, and it usually resolves spontaneously, usually within weeks to months. Remember, Botox itself lasts typically somewhere in the range of three months, so this should go away by then as well. Uh, but in some cases, it has persisted a bit longer. And if this is something they get regularly, either for cosmesis or migraine, if the person that's injecting the neurologist, et cetera, uh, or the you know, oculoplastics, whoever is, is injecting this, knows that they have dysptosis, they will adjust their pattern and dosage the next time in attempts to avoid this. Okay, Susan, now why don't you take us through some of the approach to the diagnosis? Sure, so basically, this is our traditional scope of the where we look at subject and objective and, and the plan. So, you want to get a good patient history. You want to find out about the onset, the duration, and the impact, you know, of the ptosis on the patient's activities of daily living. And then you want to do a thorough eyelid evaluation to establish, is it just as you said before, Kelly, is it unilateral? Is it bilateral? Is it symmetrical or asymmetrical? And to determine the severity of it, um, you certainly want to find out, you know, try to ascertain if it's acquired and if it's isolated, meaning if it's acquired and isolated, you know, that's good. Um, if it's non-isolated, if there are other symptoms and signs with it, that that then would um, require further diagnostic evaluation, which you're going to get into a few minutes uh, with respect yeah. to additional testing. So the initial patient interview, you should, um, you know, talk, find out if there's any trauma, eye surgery, eye disease, all the things that you just mentioned a few minutes ago. But just remember that one of the most important things is that patients don't always self-identify uh, upper eyelid droop. And, you know, part of the problem is they may assume it's not treatable. So it's important to spot the ptosis by looking for obstruction of the pupil of one or both eyes due to the drooping of the lids, as well as asymmetry uh, in the upper eyelid position. And we want to assess the lids and the pupils to establish whether it's unilateral or bilateral um, presence of asymmetry. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what the different measurements are. You know, you alluded to the MRD1 and the levator function, um, but this is going to tell us about the severity. Um, and, you know, you want to get a little bit of an idea of the impact of asking them, are you ever bothered by the appearance of your eyes or eyelids? Are you experiencing peripheral vision loss or difficulty reading? Some doctors are actually using pre, um, like little survey screening things as part of their intake surveys that they do with dry eye and other things to put a quite couple of questions in there. And that's a great way to pick it up very early in the patient's visit. So this is one of my patients. He's a gentleman, uh, such a nice man that I've been seeing for years and years. Um, he's in his mid seventies and he had been wearing um, soft lenses for years in monovision. And he was six months um, post bilateral cataract surgery, and he had monofocal IOLs put in because all we did was we decided let's just do the 20 happy thing, and we took um, the, the recipe that he had with his contacts and we translated into his IOL. So his ptosis that you see here is not a result of his surgery. He looked like this before he went into cataract surgery. So. You know, we knew that before, which is uh, which is good. And, you know, so basically when I saw him, um, I, you know, his having then gone through the surgery, I started to talk about it uh, a little bit with him. And he'd been noticing that it was increasing the droop 
uh, the right eye greater than the left over the past 20 years. And he did tell me he was bothered or his wife was bothered um, by his appearance and the appearance in photos. But what he was bothered by was end of day fatigue. And he kept saying he feels like his eyes are closing. And here he just had this wonderful cataract surgery. We treated some dry eyes. So his vision was clear, yet he really wasn't feeling all that perky visually. So we did, you know, ascribe that to the ptosis. So how did I go about um, evaluating it? Um, basically, I did an eyelid evaluation using a millimeter ruler. Um, we, we noted whether it was unilateral, bilateral, symmetric versus asymmetric. And then we looked at four particular measurements, the MRD1, the palpebral aperture, the levator function, and the lid crease measurement. Now, when I'm looking at a patient for the first time, I just don't kind of whip out my ruler. I basically get a global view. And what I look at, which just strikes me, is to me the most obvious thing is just to look at the palpebral aperture. It's also the easiest thing to bring up in conversation because it's easy to say to a patient, hey, did you ever notice that one eye looks a little more open than the other? I never say, did you notice one eye droops more than the other? I always like to come in from the positive. Uh, but to point out to them that I am noticing that there is a difference when I'm looking at them at the microscope or when my technician's taking any images of any kind, they will also alert me to that. So we want to then just take a look here at the different ways of actually doing these measurements. So the palpebral aperture, let me start with that. That's the second one here. I think that's sort of the easiest for us to look at. And that's the distance between the upper eyelid margin and the lower eyelid margin with the eye and primary gaze. And a lot of times we as clinicians, and particularly those of us who fit contact lenses, we're looking at that a lot because that has a lot to do with the vertical palpebral aperture when we design our contact lenses. But that measurement is typically in the range of 10 to 12 millimeters on both males and females. The MRD1 is what we usually measure more clinically to assess treatment and plan out treatment and to plan out our differential diagnosis. And that's a little bit different. The eye has to be in primary gaze. And what you're going to look at is the distance between the center of the pupillary light reflex, um, or as um, Kelly alluded to, the uh, Purkinje image or Hirschberg reflex, and the upper eyelid margin. So you're looking at the uh, eyelid margin to the middle of that light reflex. And normal is typically in the range of four to five millimeters. When we look at the function of the levator muscle, that's done a little differently. What you have to do is you actually have to stabilize the brow, putting your fingers on the brow to make sure they're not using their facial or brow muscles. And what you wanna have them do is, you wanna have them look down and then you're gonna measure the shift, the millimeters of shift, when you have them shift from downward gaze to upward gaze. So normal is about 15 or a little greater. A couple of mil millimeters less would you can still consider good. And, you know, 5 to 11 would be fair, and certainly 0 to 4 millimeters would be poor. And then finally, there's something called the eyelid crease height. It's a little different between males and females. Females have a little bit of more of a distance between the eyelid crease um, and the upper eyelid margin. And again, this is done in get down gaze. You have the patient look down. And basically, in, we, in women, I talk about it being the eyeshadow shelf. So it's where they put their shadow on their lower lid um, before they put the, the darker shadow in the crease. And that's what you're actually measuring. Males, it's a little bit lower. And so then once again, you can gauge or grade ptosis severity by MRD1. Uh, one to two millimeter reduction, again, limited visual impairment. Once we get close to double that, it's mild to medium. And greater than four, we have significant visual impairment. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Kelly because she's going to take us through what should we be looking for now. Let's say the patient comes in and their symptoms are non-isolated. What kinds of things do we have to be looking for, Kelly? Definitely. So this is very important um, to make sure that there's not something else going on. Hold on a second. I think I, um, I didn't go through the data on this patient. So let me just finish that. My, my apologies. So this was, I took all of these measurements and I looked at extraocular muscle function and everything. I, you know, I look at everything, not just those measurements. Um, and everything was fine. I always look at pupils. 
Um, because if a patient had Botox and they come in and the lid is drooping, and let's say the lie lid is also not moving as well, because you can get, I've had patients come in with paretic abducens muscles, you want to make sure it's not an ocular motor, you know, nerve palsy, but so you want to look at that. Always look at pupils. You want to make sure they have full lid closure. And again, he had bilateral ptosis with asymmetry. And just to show you the numbers here, so his right lid, you can see, is a little more droopy. It was 1.8 millimeters, and the OS was 2.9. When I did the levator function, that is having him start down and look up, he was able to traverse about 12 meters in the left, but only 11 in the right. And he did have a one millimeter difference in the eyelid crease height. So essentially, you know, you can look at it, you can make a global decision, but it's nice to have objective numbers in your record so that if you do start to treat or you just monitor or you're going to converse and do, you know, refer out at some point, you have, um, you know, actual uh, clinical values. Okay, back to you, Kelly. All right. Yes. Yeah, so when do we need to do additional testing and, and what testing do we need to do? So pretty much any time you see a ptosis, any time you even see an asymmetry in the either palpebral aperture or the MRD1, you really need to be looking at all of these things. So when we're talking about eyelid function, this is a test of the efferent visual system. So we have to look at the other components of the efferent visual system to see is this isolated or is it in association with any other abnormality? And so the degree of ptosis we talked about and we said, oh, the, the more the ptosis, the more symptomatic the patient may be, the more it may be interfering with their visual axis, et cetera. So the degree of ptosis is significant in that regard, but it doesn't really matter in terms of how significant the underlying pathology is if we're talking about pathology. You can have a life-threatening process where there's just one millimeter of ptosis. So any degree of asymmetry, any degree of ptosis, we definitely need to consider, could it be a neurologic problem? That means we have to look uh, for pupils in there in anisocoria. We have to look at motilities, ductions, versions, cover testing, and cover testing in multiple positions of gaze to see is there a pattern that indicates a cranial nerve palsy? Is there an asymmetry with glow positioning be it X ophthalmus or maybe even N ophthalmus, something to indicate that there's an orbital lesion. Uh, and then, of course, look for other things that indicate that this may be a congenital process. Uh, so have the patient chew. And if you do a, a cursory neurologic exam, you would do that. And when you have them chew, you would see that as they're chewing, their eyelid may be opening and closing or winking, if you will, in the Marcus Dunn bell winking phenomenon. And then we can use pharmacologic testing to help as well. So we know that when we put um, phenylephrine in, the eyelid tends to raise a bit, and that can work on the muscle of Mueller. And when we think somebody has a Horner syndrome, we can also use apiclonidine testing to confirm that Horner syndrome. So definitely additional testing in your eye exam is important to help rule out any serious underlying condition that could require medical attention or even uh, emergent evaluation. So the focus neurologic examination should always be done before even considering treating the ptosis. Let's figure out why it's there first before we think about treating it. So as we said, we want to look at the, the lids in combination with the pupils. So whenever you have an eyelid that's asymmetric, the eyelid that is more tonic, you see if there is uh, an anisocoria, is the pupil in the eye that's tonic, is it the smaller of the two? And if that's the case, you're going to be thinking, is this a Horner syndrome? Or is the pupil in the tonic eye the bigger of the two? And if that's the case, you're going to be thinking, could this be a cranial nerve 3 palsy? So with cranial nerve 3 palsy, we tend to think about this as being unilateral ptosis. And thinking about everything that cranial nerve three innervates, we would have limitation of our ductions. We would have limited superduction, infraduction, and adduction. And together, that's going to give us the pattern that we would see on cover testing. It's important to do the cover testing in different positions of gaze. Now, you may see this pattern just by you know, saying, follow my finger, if it is a significant third nerve palsy. 
but you can have their nerve palsies from something like an aneurysm that could be very subtle. So doing the cover testing in different positions of gaze is critical. And you look for a reversing hyperdeviation. So if this patient that we see the picture uh, up here, so this is a left-sided ptosis. Now it tells you this is from myasthenia gravis, but if this was a cranial nerve three palsy, and we say to the patient, look up, they would have a right hyper because the left eye would not go up. And if we said, look down, they would have a left hyper because the left eye would not look down. That's a reversing hyper from right hyper and up to left hyper and down. Whenever you see that reversing hyper from up gaze to down gaze, you always have to think about a cranial nerve three palsy. And then further, they would have an adduction deficit. So they'd get XO worse across from the vertically limited eye. So in this case, there would be a greater, greater XO in right gaze as compared with the left gaze. The pupil does not have to be affected in a third nerve palsy, so we can't rule it out just because the pupils are isochoric. If it is involved, it would be dilated, and the anisochoria would be greater in bright illumination. With Horner syndrome, often unilateral as well, and it's a more mild ptosis. So the levator affects eye opening more so. So in a third nerve palsy, we could have a greater amount of ptosis from one millimeter all the way to completely closed, whereas in Horner syndrome, it's usually only a few millimeters. There could be a motility deficit associated, and that's really uh, if we have a problem in the cavernous sinus where we have the sympathetic nerve traveling as well as the cranial nerves that innervate the extraocular muscles. The pupil would be the smaller of the two. It would be constricted, and the anisochoria would be greatest in dim illumination. So it's very important to measure pupil sizes and measure apertures, not just kind of eyeball it. Uh, and then when you measure the pupils, remember to do so in two different illuminations, as bright as possible and as dim as possible. And then thirdly, when we talk about our most worrisome differential diagnoses for ptosis, we have myasthenia gravis. That would not affect the pupils at all because that affects only voluntary muscle. Uh, ptosis could be in one or both eyes and it could be variable. Sometimes it could look like they're fairly normal and other times, especially when they're tired or at the end of the day, they can have more of a drooping lid. Because it affects voluntary muscle, that means it also affects the extraocular muscles. So they could have motility deficits, double vision, and it could be any pattern. So those are the three, and any of these three uh, could be a medical emergency. So we definitely have to keep these on the top of our mind whenever we see a ptosis. I'm gonna go through two cases here uh, when we see a ptosis and what we did and what it wound up being. So this is a 65 year old woman and she comes in complaining of a left-sided eyelid droop and you can see there is a little bit of an asymmetry there. She has no other ocular symptoms and she has no pain. Pain in the setting of ptosis is always a red flag and something that needs to be treated urgently. Uh, you'd have to think about an aneurysm potentially, especially if the pupil's bigger, or a um, carotid dissection if the pupil is smaller, but she had no pain. If you look at her pupils though, they are anisochoric and you can see the smaller pupil is on the side of the smaller aperture. Therefore, we get concerned, could this be a Horner syndrome? But it could still be myasthenia gravis and this is maybe just physiologic anisochoria. The only way we're gonna be able to tell that is to measure the pupils in bright and dim illumination. Otherwise, her history is of note for being uh, a parent everyday smoker, and she has been for some time. So with that in mind, we have to think about, could this be a mass of the lung? And she also has a recently diagnosed lung infection. Could that be associated? So here's her pupils in bright and dim illumination, and her anisochoria is greatest in dim illumination. We know in dim, the pupils should dilate, so the right pupil has gotten bigger, but the left pupil has not gotten as big as it should. So this does suggest the left sided Horner syndrome. So how do we confirm that? So in office, we can confirm that by diagnostic testing. We can use apriclonidine, 0.5%, and still one drop into each eye, wait a half hour, and if there's no change and no reversal of the anisocoria, wait an additional half hour for a total of an hour, and a positive result for Horner syndrome is what we see here. 
So in both bright and dim illumination, 60 minutes after the use of apiclonidine, we see that the left pupil is now the larger of the two. So we have anisocoria, but it switched, it reversed, which was the bigger pupil. So that reversal confirms Horner syndrome. It doesn't tell us the cause of the Horner syndrome or the localization, but it does confirm that there is damage to that sympathetic pathway. So we're gonna to need to look at the entire sympathetic pathway for pathology. And she was found to have a bacterial infection that she already knew of, uh, but it was at the apex of the lung on imaging and it was the cause of her toxic. So we were able to rule out any other pathology on top of that. This is another woman, she's 76 years old and she comes in because she's complaining of a right eyelid droop, but she's also having some double vision as you can appreciate just based on the misalignment of her eyes. Her systemic history is remarkable for diabetes and hypertension. Her afferent function is completely normal and she also denies any pain. So our differential here is going to be, well, you know, it could be myasthenia. Anytime there's a ptosis, it could be myasthenia. So that's always gonna be on the list. And could it also be a third nerve palsy? Because what do we see? We look at the eye and you know, a lot of times people say, oh, you know, the eye is down and out. Um, remember, you don't need to have that presentation to have a third nerve palsy. So we wanna look for a pattern. Does it have that reversing hyper, for instance, that we talked about? Is it all localized to the one eye? So that's gonna be very important. And in her case, when we did our ductions and our motilities, we can see that in right and left gazes, that's the clue that gives it away. Because you, you know, we do see, yes, there's some vertical misalignment as well. Uh, yeah, the, the left eye is higher. Maybe are we gonna get a reversing hyper? But look what happens when we look to the right, we see the left eye is not adducting. And when we look the other direction, the right eye is not adducting. But it's the fact that yeah, it's not just affecting one eye, it's affecting both eyes. That tells us, this bilateral presentation tells us this is most likely myasthenia gravis. So we would do more in-office testing to tell if that seems to be the case. She did have weakness of the avicularis oculi muscle, and you can tell that just by having the patient squeeze their eye tightly closed and trying to open. And we were able to open her lids on both sides. We test for fatigue by having the patient sustain up gaze for two minutes. And during that two minute time, you can see her aperture decreased even more as she fatigued. So her lid closed more. And then with ice pack testing with cold on the eyelids for two minutes, we have an increase in our aperture. And those are all features suggestive of myasthenia gravis. So she did undergo workup and myasthenia gravis was confirmed and she was treated for such under the care of neurology. Now, um, Susan's gonna tell us a little bit more about treating acquired ptosis once we've ruled out those other pathologies. Great, Kelly. Yes. Yes. One thing you really things that Kelly just talked about, if you now focus on treating, you know, the more, I'll use the word benign entity, uh, although, you know, something that patients are not happy with, um, of acquired ptosis. So, you know, the traditional standard has been surgery. We all know that, which is why a lot of times we weren't bringing it up or the patient wasn't bringing it up. Um, and surgery is certainly a nice option. Uh, patients are good candidates and they're in good health and they're good healers, but not all patients are good candidates. Um, you know, we certainly want to work with good oculoplastic surgeons, um, but there are complication risks. Um, they include bleeding and scarring, infection, um, over under correction. Um, there are different ways of doing it where there doesn't have to be general anesthesia, but uh, for the most part, there is a significant amount of, of anesthesia necessary. Patients can react to that negatively as well. Um, but we should also consider now pharmacological treatment, which is such a great way to avoid the risks of surgery. Uh, it allows patients to restore the function of the lids and it allows us really greater access and more patients can be treated. And certainly, I think if you're like me, you would consider a pharmacological therapy before a surgical one, the surgical one being more invasive. So I would believe we would gravitate towards bringing it up to patients when they're younger versus waiting, because we all know that surgery probably has a lifetime. And if you do it too young, they're going to need to be, you know, touched up. So what are we talking about in terms of pharmacological treatment? Well, 
We have a solution of oxymetazoline, a hypothalamic um, solution, which is 0.1%, which is RVL1201. And the active ingredient um, is something we're familiar with. It's a well-established pharmacological agent. We've seen it in nasal sprays, some uh, now defunct eye drops. Uh, it is available as a topical cream for patients with rosacea. But this new formula uh, is in a preservative-free uh, balance, uh, you know, salt solution. But what's really nice about it, it's also uh, the inactive ingredient uh, is something called hypromellose, which is um, HPMC, which we all know from being a great lubricating agent in artificial tear solution. And what does hypromellose do? It cross-links upon contact with the surface of the eye. So it coats the eye and protects the ocular surface. So RVL1201 is indicated for the treatment of acquired blepharotosis or ptosis in adults. You administer it once a day as a single drop to one or both eyes. And um, basically now this is a way to introduce treatment at an earlier level um, and to enable us to treat more patients. So if you remember back to where we started, we talked about mechanism of action. Remember we were talking about which receptors were on the different muscles and, uh, and the reason we were talking about that is because oxymetazoline is a direct acting alpha adrenergic receptor agonist. So we talked about the fact that Mueller's muscle expresses alpha one and two adrenergic receptors. So what does this tell us? It tells us that the oxymetazoline is likely working on Mueller's muscle. Um, remember the levator is beta one and that's, you know, from the cranial nerve, that's not sympathetic smooth muscle. So we now have a selective agonist for Mueller's muscle. And if you remember back, Mueller's muscle is responsible for one to two millimeters of elevation, the levator being responsible for the greater amount. So what happens when we treat patients with oxymetazoline 0.1%? We're going to look at a couple of different uh, ways of assessing the effect of it. And the first one that we're going to look at is the visual field. And this is really interesting because some researchers uh, several years ago back in England um, which is why it's called the Lester visual, peripheral visual field test. They came up with a modified Humphrey visual field test to specifically assess patients with ptosis. And so what they did was they changed it up so that we're getting more points in the superior visual field compared to the inferior visual field. The LPFT examines a 48 degree range in the superior visual field using a grid. And what they did was they shifted the center of a fixation 15 degrees inferiorly to allow for maximum superior field testing. And the way we define the height of the defect is it's the lowest point in degrees where there are three horizontal contiguous absolute defects. So what that means is that when there's an increase in the number of points seen on the LPFT, that would then represent an improvement in the superior upper visual field. So now we can look at the uh, graph on the left. And this is published data that's combined between two phase three clinical trials uh, with one daily administration of RVL1201. And you can see that it resulted in significant visual field improvement from baseline. And here we have day one, six hours post installation. The vehicle is represented in gray, the active ingredient in orange. And you can see the difference. And fast forward to day 14, and you know, just looking, let's say, at two hours post-installation, you see as great um, a difference, if not more. So we now see that it does have a very positive effect in restoring the superior visual field function in the patients. And then, of course, you know, we talked about MRD1 and, you know, how important that was. And let's take a look here. There's a, you know, when we use this pharmacological agent, we not only had a rapid onset of five minutes, but it lasted for six hours and there was no regression of effect. There was no essential prophylaxis. The effect didn't wear off. So if you look at day one, you can see that the lids are lifted. Uh, they max out probably somewhere between two and four hours. There's very little, you know, um, uh, decrease at the six hour level. So it lasts a night, you know, pretty full day for most patients. And you can look and see the same thing at the two-week level. And then this graph looks at um, day 42, which is six weeks. 
Uh, and this is just 15 minutes post installation, but you can see you're still getting a very active effect of the oxymetazoline. <clears throat> so the important thing, and, and the question that comes up a lot is, so you have this agent, and we all now understand how it works, but you know, what are the, um, what, what does the safety data look like? Is it safe? Because, you know, it's nice to look pretty and to have, you know, not drooping upper lids, but does it come at any medical expense? And the answer is invariably, uh, you know, a resounding no. Um, they looked at a lot of different factors here. And um, just to break it down for you, most of the adverse events were very, very mild. There was very little discontinuation, which to me speak most um, strongly to the safety because patients are pretty quick to drop out of studies if they're feeling not so great as a result of the treatment um, arm of it. And so just to give you numbers, there was about three out of 94 and one out of 109 subjects in the two six-week studies that had um, adverse events resulting in treatment discontinuation. And the interesting thing is the treatment discontinuation had nothing to do with the active ingredient. They had some events that were not at all related. And there were, you know, in terms of any serious adverse events, which again, weren't related, it was only reported in four, which is 1% of patients and 0.5% of patients in the RVL and vehicle groups respectively. So you can see there was no difference essentially between the arm receiving the vehicle only and the active ingredient. So again, very safe. But most importantly, if we're talking about an alpha adrenergic agent. So what do we think about? We think about pupils, we think about intraocular pressure, we think about visual acuity, no clinically significant mean change in any of the vital or ophthalmologic signs, blood pressure, things like that. So again, a very, very effective agent and very, very safe. That being said, the next question we sometimes get is, well, okay, so it's safe, but there have to be some patients I shouldn't be prescribing this and recommending this to. And yes, that's true. I mean, just from the discussion, you might already guess who those are. And that's any patient where the ptosis may be associated with neurological orbital disease. All the things Kelly already talked about. Um, Yes, you could have an impact on blood pressure. And these would be patients that would be not well controlled. You know, patients that you know have severe or significant cardiovascular problems, you're going to want to use them with caution, but maybe not at all. Um, it may increase the risk of angle closure. Certainly, if you have a patient with uh, angles that narrow, you know, my suggestion is you would want to probably refer them out for treatment um, anyway. Um, and probably maybe just avoid it uh, to be on the safe side. So again, a very narrow bit of patients that might not be candidates, but for the majority of our patients, it's very, very safe. So how do we sort of wrap this all up and summarize it? I mean, the, the bottom line is, there's no reason for us to wait to start identifying and treating cleftosis. You know, what's nice is we now have something that we can do um, yes, it's, we all have great relationships with our oculoplastics. This isn't going to, you know, take away from their um, practices because patients will still want, you know, many will still want to go ahead and have surgery at some point. But it's really nice that we can be the gatekeepers and we can be in control. But more importantly, I think what this does is it refreshes our memory of the conditions and reminds us that this is something that is part of a really good, thorough, and important primary care exam. So, you know, be sure to identify ptosis, um, know that this affects your patients, come up with verbiage that's comfortable for you and for the patient. It may change from patient to patient. And just know that you do have a nice state pharmaceutical agent that can help restore patients' function and their self-esteem. We can take some questions. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, Susan and, and Kelly. And I am going to ask everyone, if you have questions, please put them right in that question box and we will uh, get to them. I'll, I'll open it up here. Let me uh, get the questions going. Oh my, there are a bunch of them here. Yep. And a question here, sort of uh, about the usage of the medication in, in practice. So 
Um, can a patient elect to use it on an occasional basis and still have it be as effective as if they use it on a daily basis? 100% yes, that's the beauty yes. of it. I mean, patients um, love it to use just cosmetically uh, when they're going out, you know, especially with COVID, they're all, you know, saying, well, I'm sitting around the house, I don't have to look so good or whatever. So absolutely, it works just as well on, you know, use it one day, you cannot use it for a month and it'll work equally well. Usually the question is the opposite. Um, people want to know if I use it every day, will it stop working? But um, that question is equally good, and the answer is yes, you can use it as desired. Excellent. And a question here. Okay, so this is a, a rigid contact lens question. <laughs> so, Susan, this is right up uh, your alley, I guess. So, is the medication effective for patients who've exhibited, um, for instance, like lid dehiscence secondary to wearing hard lenses for a long time? Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and so, look, again, it's not going to repair the, you know, aponeurosis if you have uh, levator dehiscence or disinsertion, but it'll, it'll, as somebody once used, it's like a cup of coffee for the Mueller's muscle. Um, so <laughs> will, it will work on Mueller's muscle and you will get a millimeter of lift. So the answer is yes. Right. Give them a, a remover to use for their lenses if it's that bad too. Teach them how to take it out with the, one of those little DMV removers. Yep. And a practice management question here. So this is kind of an interesting one. What would you say, how frequently are you actually, you know, trying out the medication on patients that come through your practice now? Is it something that you'll just routinely do and say, hey, why don't you give this a try? Um, just based on your findings, is it becoming something that you're you're recommending to, you know, a significant proportion of your patients? And I guess, Susan, you do have so many um, specialty lens patients, so I would imagine you see it very frequently. Well, I, I do. I, that's exactly how I do it. You know, a lot of doctors say, well, do you bring them back for a full workup? And the answer is I don't. If I see the droop, I take the measurements right then and there. It does not take all that long. Um, I take an MRD1. I take a pupil aperture. I don't usually do all four. Um, sometimes I'll do a visual field um, if I'm concerned about other things going on. But um, absolutely, I do it right then and there. Um, you know, patients love to go out not just seeing better but looking better. So if they come to me for a routine exam and I'm giving them a nice new prescription for their glasses and I can also make them feel better about how they look and make them feel a little perkier, that's what they remember. They don't remember how awesome my refraction was. They remember that I helped them lift their lids. Right. And Kelly, do you have a similar experience? Well, so a lot of my patients that have neurologic issues, so I see more of the patients with the myasthenia, et cetera. Um, so they're getting treated in another way with systemic medications. But for instance, I see patients who have had Botox maybe for migraines, uh, and there happened to be some spread of the Botox into the levator muscle, and they are left with ptosis. So definitely, I have given and recommend this to those patients, and it's something that they use temporarily, uh, but to get them through that period until it wears off, and they're very appreciative of it, that it's not causing this uh, asymmetry in their appearance. So definitely a, a temporary use for it as well. Right. Another interesting question here, um, you know, Susan, you mentioned that, that you know, you, you pounce and take measurements uh, almost straight away. It obviously adds time to your exam. Do you pass that cost on at all to the patient? I do not. Um, and I, I do not. I, I include it as part of my comprehensive exam. Right. Yes, and, and in reality, it really can be done very, very quickly. Um, you know, if you are measuring pupils, you already have the same measuring tool in your hand, and you're really just taking a few more measurements. Um, so, you know, in all actuality, to do all these lid measurements, it really takes maybe a minute. Um, to measure apertures and MRD and levator. Now, if it's not, not isolated, then it's like some of the entities that uh, Kelly's going through, and I feel like there's something more going on, then certainly. Oh, well, um, yeah, that takes uh, Because then you have more diagnosis codes you can use. You know, right. you can use ptosis, but you are looking to, um, you know, rule out more serious entities, and you're probably going to do other testing. So it wouldn't be wrong to do it. I just don't. Right. Right. Uh, question here, uh, one person, uh, you know, tried the medication and the, the patient got a headache. Um, and can you think of any mechanism, why, how that works or why that might happen? 
I would wonder if they get a headache when they're they're dilated as well. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's just um, there are patients that report slight headaches when you put dilated, mild dilated. You know, when you do your dilated exam. Um, so I mean, I could come up with theories, but I, you know, they would just be yeah, just you know. You know several theories you know how droopy was the lid over the pupil and did it lift now and they're getting more light in and is that giving them a headache or, you know, well, or is it, it could be acting on that and causing right. deeper, and, yeah that, that's my theory or yeah something to do with the uh, sympathetic exactly. pathway mm -hmm. yeah. that's probably most likely what it is but yep uh, in interesting uh, sort of question here. We had one doctor who uh, recommends that a patient comes in for a separate brief visit to take before and after photos, um, which I would guess is a really powerful way of showing someone if, if the medication's working. Yeah, we do that the same day. We put the drop in, we have them sit for a few minutes, we have them go select their eyewear in the optical. I take a quick picture. I actually use um, either their phone or my phone, just the eyes, no identifying characteristics. I do not put it on social media. And um, they go out, they pick out their frames or whatever, you know, or they just relax for a few minutes. I certainly do it before I put in any dilating agents because you don't want to confound the results. But literally, you'll see a difference in five minutes. If not in five, you see it in 15. But it's a great way for me to have them sit and browse uh, the optical. So it works out very nicely. And then I get them back in. I take a picture and I show them the before and after right then and there. Yep. And for those who haven't tried it, you know, in some patients it actually is quite quite noticeable, right? I mean, I know when I tried it on myself, you know, I, I got the comment from my wife, you actually look awake. <laughs> so I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but yeah. <laughs> um, so let's see, more, more questions here. A lot of practice management questions, which I find really interesting. Um, you know, people, we always like to talk about the science here, but I think people are really interested in how you've actually worked this into your practices. Um, you sort of look looking for those tips. And one one question here was about insurance. And I again, I know nothing about this. Perhaps you guys could shed some light, um, you know, about whether or not you, you've seen this covered by insurance or not. Well, your diagnose, you know, your your exam, your diagnosis would be covered. Um, the solution itself is not um, uh, covered by insurance. It just isn't at this, you know, at this point. Right. But certainly your workup, you could certainly bill it to insurance. Yep. It, is, it is a medical, you know, workup. And so, and some, someone else writes here, which is an interesting thing, is if a patient gets a good response in office, what they'll do is dispense samples. Yep. And then the patient will actually call back if they want the full prescription. Right. Right. We do it a little differently. We actually get the, we actually put the prescription in electronically while they're there. It doesn't mean that it's automatically ordered because it's not ordered until the patient is actually contacts the pharmacy or the pharmacy contacts them. So we put it in right away. It just saves us another step. So we tell the patient the prescription that we are authorizing the prescription, um, and you know it's up to, if they like it, then they can um, it'll all be taken care of, you know, by the uh, by the pharmacy. Right. And this is actually leading to another question, again, more practice management related of, of how you actually prescribe this um, and, and where patients can go to, to actually get it. So, um, yeah, so there is a specialty pharmacy. It's put in there. I think, um, Adam, what we probably want to do is have, uh, have RVL get back to them on this and, you know, and, and have some reps tell them on this. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. So for any sort of access questions like that, definitely we'll have RVL mm -hmm. get in touch with folks um, and they'll reach out to you or we can, you know, we'll also post on OD wire sort of the best ways to get in contact with them. And we're running a little bit out of time, but I just want one one person had a question that I really did kind of want an answer to. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned that there could be adverse reactions. Have you personally actually seen this out of all the patients that, that you prescribed uh, the drug for? Um, I have not. And just to tell you what these adverse reactions were, they were nothing related to the medication. So actually, it was things like arthralgia, um, something with the kidneys, uh, one cerebrovascular accident. None of it was related. There was hyperparathyroidism. 
Those were the serious adverse events. None of it was actually related to the medication. Uh, I have not had any non-serious adverse uh, reactions at all. I haven't had any patients call me up and say, look, I started to use this and this is what happened. Uh, I can't use it anymore. So for me, not one. And yeah, I, nor have I. I haven't had any either. I probably have, I don't know how many, but probably dozens and dozens of patients on it now. Right. And I guess that's there's one follow-up question here that they had. So what is the most common sort of thing that you've seen or top tip if people should be looking out for something? Well, from my standpoint, I would say one of the most important things is, first of all, just to look for the ptosis to begin with. Um, so have a greater awareness of the eyelids and do the eyelid measurements. Are you talking about adverse events, Adam? Are you talking about what they should be looking at for problems or for prescribing? Well, both. I mean, since since we're getting to the end here, I think, you know, if you could give us yeah. your, your your key takeaways, since both of you have, have probably more experience uh, with this medicine than just about anyone. So we're, we're all all ears. So my my pearl, and aside from everything else I said, is don't discriminate men and women because there is no gender difference and men do care just as much. They just may not as, uh, express it as uh, willingly, wittingly. So, you know, question your men. They actually feel good when you asking about because they're a little shy about uh, mentioning it. Right. And then just importantly, make sure you rule out uh, the, the serious causes before you jump right into treatment. Okay. Well, great. So, so Kelly, Susan, thank you so much for this. And everyone, thank you for, for coming out tonight. Um, this archive will be up on ODYR hopefully sooner rather than later. And we can also keep the conversation going there online. So again, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. And I guess uh, we will see you online. Good night, everyone. Thank you.